if this is possible for Darlene, what about everybody else? What about all that suffering that's happening out there that's avoidable? And people are still being told that there's nothing they can do when right here in front of me, this miracle just happened. 55 million people worldwide are living with dementia, and that's going to jump to 78 million by 2030, just really a few years away. You know, I tell my patients all the time, poor health, including that of your brain, is not a normal part of aging. So what's really happening here from your perspective? So as the demographics have shifted towards elder adults, we have more people living in that time of their life when they're at the highest risk of developing dementia. So actually the incidence of Alzheimer's and dementia is going down. So per 1,000 people in the Western world, fewer of us get Alzheimer's. However, so many of us are in that age where we have high risk. And this is one of those things. The year we were born, we can't change. Our gender, we cannot change. Our APOE status, we cannot change our genetics. And yet the message is that those unmodifiable risk factors are what count. And that's what's going to determine how we age. And yet you and I well know from working with patients, from working with clients, from all the the testimonials I'm sure you get from your books, that there is so much we can do to change how we age and how those genetics express themselves as we go into that last chapter of life. There is almost an overwhelming amount that can be done to change the trajectory of our health. And really what we have to do is not get overwhelmed, be systematic about how we apply these modifiable risk factors. So don't worry too much about the things we can't change, but really focus on the things like our diet, what we decide to put in our mouths each day, what time we go to sleep, the people we surround ourselves with, how much movement we get. Those are the things that determine whether or not we'll get dementia, whether or not we'll age gracefully and well. Well said. First of all is, well, let's, you and I both deal with folks who have carry the ApoE4 gene, the quote Alzheimer's gene. I wish that had never been used. But in fact, at least in my practice, I see more people with dementia and or Alzheimer's who don't carry the Alzheimer's gene than I do who do carry it. Is that true? You know, I see a mix of both. And unfortunately, there was a recent Nature paper, I'm sure you're well aware of this, that essentially said that if you carry the ApoE44, if you got a copy from mom and a copy from dad, you eventually will get Alzheimer's and dementia. And yet the Lancet Commission report suggests that 40% of worldwide dementias are preventable or at the very least delayable. And I think that that's much more true and much less alarming and much more empowering. And I suspect that as the the research evolves, we're going to see that that number that the Lancet Commission report, the 40%, is actually closer to 60, 80, maybe even 90% of us can think of Alzheimer's as optional, that there's a lot that we can do even if our genetics prime us towards the production of beta amyloid plaques, towards the, the potential for vascular dementia, heart disease, as you well know, with your background. And so I think that APOE, what I encourage people to do at this stage, when I started my career, people would say, oh, I don't want to know my APOE status because it's just going to give me anxiety. It's going to keep me up at night and there's nothing I can do to prevent or delay or reverse dementia. And yet now what I've seen in my career is that that's absolutely false. And that knowing your APOE status earlier on means that you can make different decisions from your spouse or your neighbor who you're not you know, genetically related to you can decide to do the things that protect your brain health and start earlier. With Alzheimer's, we know that changes in the brain start happening decades before we even have that first symptom of not remembering where our keys are, what the name of that person was, or the name of some noun in our our life that we should know that we would have known five or 10 years ago. When we notice our brain changing, that's definitely time to take action. But if we know our genetic risk, we can take action even sooner and prevent. Yeah, you're right. I've been testing the ApoE4 for 25 years now. And early on, a lot of people said, no, 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 I don't want to know. And I said, no, you do want to know because, you know, that you can take action. In fact, in one of my books, there's a wonderful study looking at women who carry the four and regular exercise in those women, a lifetime of exercise, really is preventative of developing dementia, but if you develop it, it's delayed 11 years 
compared to people who don't have a regular exercise program. I mean, that's a difference. Let's, let's suppose you were going to get it at 75. Well, now it's at 86. Well, that's a whole lot of time to enjoy your spouse, your grandchildren, maybe your great-grandchildren. I mean, that 11 years, that's, that's worth it. It's why I get out of bed in the morning, Dr. Gandhi. Really, it's because I hear from patients and their family members, I got my mom back. I got my life back. And I hear these stories of, you know, grandma who was in the corner, dejected and not isolated, basically, during a holiday. And the next year, a year later, she's picking out age-appropriate gifts for her grandkids and cooking her famous apple pie and really back in the game of enjoying life and those meaningful connections. That's why I show up. That's why I do this. You know, in the clinical trial, going back to the APOE conversation, in the clinical trial I had the fortune of doing in my office, we had a six-month feasibility trial. And we took 23 participants through this trial. And it was a six-month intervention that completely based on Dr. Bredesen's work, my mentor's work. And what we saw was that after just six months of this intervention, 74% of participants, or 17 out of the 23, improved. And now all of these participants had measurable cognitive impairment. We use the MOCA score to mm-hmm. determine eligibility. So the MOCA is the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, and a perfect score is 30 out of 30. Normal is 26 and above. Our participants all had MOCA scores between 12 and 23. This is moderate cognitive decline, and some had diagnoses of Alzheimer's. And we saw that most of the time, 74% of the time, they improved within just six months. And many of them were either APO3-4 or 4-4 carriers. You know, I keep reminding my patients, I have a gentleman who carries 3-4, and he's now 98 years old, and he runs his family business. His three daughters will not let him retire because he's so good at it, and he drives from L.A. to Palm Springs to see me twice a year, drives his own car. And, you know, he doesn't have Alzheimer's. Years ago, I met a young woman who was 85 who carried the 4-4. And 85 and actively plays tennis. She, I described her as ditzy, which I guess is a nice maybe a terrible term to use, but... Hopefully an endearing. An endearing, but perfectly, you know, lived alone, perfectly functional, and she was 85 with a Mm 4-4. And when I first met her, because I have been taught that, oh, come on, a 4-4 will never make it to 85 without dementia. And there there she was, and talking about her tennis scores and hopping in. She'd always come in in her little tennis dress. And uh, she actually made it to 91 So there is, I think we're all trying to rewrite the expectations of what most of us were taught that, oh yeah, maybe we can slow this down, but the idea of reversing it or delaying it a considerable period of time, I think that's why you're right, we get up in the morning. You know, I came to this as a skeptic. I had been told like everyone else, trained in the years that we were, I was, that this was not anything that you could do something about, that as a provider to suggest that you could help someone with, with Alzheimer's was to actually give them false hope. And as Dr. Bredesen now says, you know, that's actually false hopelessness. And that's detrimental. That really it does our patients a disservice to tell them there's nothing they can do for Alzheimer's or dementia because there's an overwhelming amount that we can do. And I think where we went wrong was these perverse incentives in the pharmaceutical industry that have us target, use taxpayer dollars, to figure out what that single molecule intervention is going to be that's going to solve this problem. And so we we went down this path of beta amyloid plaques as the cause of Alzheimer's and dementia, missing the common sense analysis of, no, a complex organism is going to have multiple things that are going to lead to the same dysregulation and neurodegeneration in this case. You know, it's so simple for us to look at a houseplant, right? And if it's wilting, if it's dying, you don't think, oh, it must be misfolded proteins. I better get those misfolded proteins out of the plant, right? You think, is it getting enough sunlight? Is it getting enough water? Is it getting too much of something? Is it getting, you know, does it have enough nutrients in the soil or has it outgrown its pot? But you think through 
what are the inputs and outputs of a complex system that are required for it to thrive? And when we apply that concept, which is what Dr. Bredesen does, to it's to the brain, we get common sense outcomes. We get better neurological function, better neuronal function. And then you know, all of the downstream effects of better cognition, better mood, better health over time as we age. And so even though I came to it skeptical when I heard Dr. Bredesen speak at a conference, what he described was so common sense and it fit my ethos as a naturopathic doctor. How can we focus on health rather than on disease? And if we focus our energy on promoting the health of the system, of the cell, then we're going to get better function. We're going to avoid disease and particularly the complex chronic diseases associated with aging. Since you brought up you know, looking for miracle cures, you know, the one thing that's going to do it. A few years back, there was a miracle cure, breakthrough treatment for Alzheimer's. Walk me through why they talk about false hope. Why do these things keep coming up? And is why do they almost always fizzle out? Right, well, we think of beta amyloid as the cause. And unfortunately, it does us a disservice because it is an oversimplification. Now, beta amyloid are absolutely associated and correlated with Alzheimer's disease. However, they're not the cause. There's something above the beta amyloid that triggers the production, and the beta amyloid is actually there to protect us. We know now that it's antimicrobial. Literally, if a microbe enters our brain, things like P. gingivalis associated with gingivitis, things like herpes simplex virus, that can trigger the production of beta amyloid. We know that one night of sleep deprivation leads to a measurable accumulation of beta amyloid in people who in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. But we also know, so we know that if this accumulates, it can lead to structural change in the brain, which is very real and associated with age-related memory loss. However, we miss the point if we don't say what triggered the production of beta amyloid or what allowed for the accumulation of beta amyloid. If we don't use it as an invitation to look for the cause, then we miss the point. And the other issue is that when we take it away, we've gotten very good at this, right? We've gotten very good at getting rid of amyloid. And in the research models, we've used that as a surrogate marker. So instead of asking what's really meaningful for patients, is your cognition better? Is your quality of life better? We've asked, is your amyloid gone? And what we see is that, yes, we can do that, but it doesn't lead to better cognitive outcomes. Unfortunately, the best that these new drugs do, these are antibody therapies, monoclonal antibodies that remove amyloid, they reduce the rate of decline. So what you do is you take a torturous process, the long goodbye that is Alzheimer's, and you draw it out. And this is not a last ditch effort that you use when somebody has severe Alzheimer's. Actually, it's only really clinically indicated for people who are in the earlier stages. And unfortunately, it works least well in women who are ApoE44 positive, who are the most likely to end up with Alzheimer's. And it comes at a cost, not only financial cost, but it comes at the risk of brain bleeding and brain swelling. And the risk is very real. Very real. And the cost and the is cost. very high. Right. I mean, thousands of dollars out of pocket, thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars to Medicare. Plus, you need to be close to a large medical center. So, you know, if you, you're the algorithm of who fits in the, or the Venn diagram of who can get access to these medications is quite low because you need to be close to a major medical center because you need to be monitored for these potential side effects. Right. And it, it's going to take the time, right? You've got to go get the MRIs. You've got to follow up with the specialist. And you've got to go get these IVs that may or may not be helpful. Take me back. You said you entered this as kind of a skeptic. And certainly my experience with Big Ed, who I write about in my books, I was certainly skeptical that you could do anything about reversing coronary disease. Uh, your first patient's name was Dar Darlene? That's right, yeah. Uh, so tell me about Darlene. Yeah, she came with, in with her husband, completely dependent on him. She had a MOCA score of two. So again, normal is 26 and above, 30 is perfect. She had a two. I was talking to- And we're to not her. talking about a chocolate cappuccino that you get at Starbucks, a MOCA score? <laughs> <laughs> Montreal Cognitive Assessment. Oh, okay. Thank Some people you. might yeah. be getting the slums test or they might be getting the mini mental status exam. These yeah. are all 
out of 30 and you know, different providers have a preference for different ones. What we use in my office is the MOCA, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. And she had a two. Essentially, my interaction with her, I'd start to ask her a question, you know, what did you have for dinner last night? Or how much exercise have you gotten in the past week? I could see the wheels in her brain spinning. But by the time she was ready to formulate an answer, she'd forgotten the question. She might have enough to give me a yes or no. And her handwriting was really cramped. It was at an angle. You couldn't even read it. She had trouble communicating. She was completely dependent on her husband. Right? She, there was no way she was going to work. She was a liability to him, basically. And he was terrified. And he was so dedicated. And she had this huge smile. You know, she connected with you. You could see her soul was there. And she had this flor pink floral dress and this black leather studded bag. And he would talk about how one of the functions she retained was she would play dress up. She would basically go into her closet and put on all these clothes. And she was just this amazing woman. She had been a teacher, a school teacher. And you could see that like there was creativity still in there. There was the soul still in there. And I was heartbroken the day I saw them because I could see how special she was. And I can see how much he loved her and cared for her. But I had never seen someone get better. And her husband had, thank goodness, way more confidence than I had. This was in 2017, right after Dr. Bredesen had published his book, The End of Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And so he had the book and he was so, he, he was very attached. He was like, there was no talking him out of this. He was in it and I had to sort of hide my, my skepticism. I didn't have enough confidence, but I went through the motions. So I, we talked about getting her amalgams out. We got her on bioidentical hormone replacement. She got on the supplements that were nootropics also detox supplements. They were living in a moldy bedroom and they, they actually just walled off their bedroom and moved into the living room. They started ballroom dancing three times a week, which they had done previously. They started walking. They got on the ketogenic diet. They were all in. They dove in fully. And really, he did because she didn't have the mm -hmm. ability to. She and didn't have a choice. She didn't have a choice. He was all in. And so, you know, I said goodbye and wished them well, but did not expect what I saw six weeks later, which was her MOCA score went up to a seven. She was talking in complete sentences. They were bickering about something that had happened on the way into the office. And she was there. She was back. Now, she wasn't going back to work, but this was just six weeks later. And what I saw was she continued to improve as we worked together. But in that moment, you know, it's one of those moments, I'm sure maybe with Big Ed, you remember this, but I remember exactly what I was wearing and the way the light was shining in the room when I saw those two MOCA scores, the two compared to the seven just six weeks later. And I, I looked up at her husband and I was like, we must have done something wrong. Like, this isn't possible. I, I questioned myself. I was still that skeptical. And he's like, no, no, talk to her. Like, this is very real. And then where my brain went next was, oh my God, if this is possible for Darlene, what about everybody else? What about all that suffering that's happening out there that's avoidable? And people are still being told that there's nothing they can do when right here in front of me, this miracle just happened. And so, you know, she was the first one and that was the moment I decided to dedicate my life to this. How can you not, right? Yeah. And then I saw it over and over and over again in my clinical practice that people with early stage dementia with mild cognitive impairment and even with severe dementia got better, that their quality of life improved. They were able to communicate again, say, I'm hot, I'm cold, I'm hungry, I need to go to the bathroom, right? They were able to get back, they lose continence and they were able to get back bladder control and bowel control. I mean, really big things that change the quality of our lives and our dignity as we age. And that, it's so meaningful. And then I very fortunate to get to do research in my office and then open Marama and just expand the access to this type of care. And so at your center, you actually want to try to get people out of your, you know, assisted living center back into their home. That's the goal. And, and it, it, ha it works. It happens. You're kind of a halfway house. <laughs> <laughs> or sort of a retreat center. I, I think of it as a spa-like experience. I want everyone to want go. to come. Yeah. Really, we wanted to, no one, I'm, my, my mom, she's, take me out and shoot me before you send me to one of those places, right? Because she's seen what happened to her grandma and what happened to other people in our family where they're resigned to a senior living facility where they lose all dignity. They're locked in a, in a room. They're watching TV. They're fed cake and cookies. And it's just the long goodbye, right? It, it's just waiting for their demise. And yet I think that there, it, it's very easy to get an alternative to that. I think if we invest in our health earlier, and I think if we take it seriously, you know, around retirement age or maybe a little bit later, if we're starting to notice those cognitive changes, 
that we fully immerse ourselves in a program, whether it's at home or with more assistance and an immersive experience, that we fully immerse ourselves in the lifestyle that generates good health habits and gets us that cellular function back. And that's not impossible. And we see that people who move in in the earlier stages, in six, eight months, we see them fully regain cognitive function. They're able to move home with the MOCA score of 30. And so it depends, you know, not, we don't guarantee results, but when we set people up for success, it works. If you found this video helpful, I think you're gonna love this one. You won't make ketones for multiple days and you will fall flat on your face trying intermittent fasting, meal skipping, skipping breakfast. And there, a tablespoon of MCT oil may be just what you need to get you through that period